Okay, everyone, uh, so now please join me in welcoming Eric, who is a PhD student at the FU in Amsterdam, and he will talk about ASLR. Please give him a warm round of applause. Hello. Like the Herald said, I'm Eric, PhD student at the VU in Amsterdam, at the FUSEC group, and I'll be presenting work that we have done in the group today. The work uh, I'm presenting, most of the work has been done by Ben and Kafe, and by Stefan, who showed that the attack that I'm presenting is applicable to all 22 CPU microarchitectures that he's tested, so credits to them. I tried to sneak this slide in all my talks, but this time it's especially apt because this talk is about finding them. So this talk is about attacking ASLR, which is short for address space layout randomization. It's a, an exploit mitigation technique, which as far as deployment concerned is, is one of the success stories since it's, it's been introduced, been widely adopted, and it makes exploitation somewhat more difficult. The way ASLR makes it more difficult is that it changes the location of code and data usually every time the process is run so that an attacker cannot rely on certain addresses to be the same all the time. So on modern 64-bit architectures, the address space usually is 48 bits which means you can address about 256 terabytes of memory. Of course, you cannot write everywhere or read everywhere because your computer probably doesn't have that much memory. So in reality, only a very small portion of the memory is allocated to a process. And so it's quite easy to change the location of this memory. So it uh, makes life for the exploit writer a tiny bit more difficult because it's very useful to know the location of data. For example, if you want to overwrite a return address on the stack, then it's nice to know where you can jump to. And of course, if you don't know, you might jump into nowhere and then the program crashes. However, yeah, that not much is needed to, to thwart this mitigation. You just need to leak location of the memory. So I really like this backronym. So you can try to reuse the bug that you can use to exploit to first leak information and then exploit. Or if that's not possible, you'll have to find another bug which allows you to leak this uh, location. Or maybe you don't have to. So this presentation is about an attack which uses a side channel from JavaScript on processes in the hardware itself to discover information about uh, locations of data or code in memory. So the modern CPU architecture is a wondrous abstraction layer. So even if you, as a programmer, write machine code, there's lots of stuff you don't have to worry about, especially stuff to make your, uh, your programs fast. Uh, memory accesses are very slow compared to your CPU on modern uh, computers. And that's why there is a cache mechanism built in. Other things uh, are also abstracted away. For example, if your program does a memory access, the data is written to the cache. But where is it written? Your program gives off a virtual address to the CPU, which then and the CPU needs to translate that to a physical address, which is done by a, a component called the memory management unit. The memory management unit has a small cache of mappings from virtual memory to physical memory. But when an address is not in the cache, it has to do a page table walk. And the page table walk is what we are going to try to attack. Uh, we'll measure the effect that page table walk will have on the L3 cache, the last uh, and biggest cache in the CPU, to find out what's happening in the page table walk. So we're talking about doing a timing attack from JavaScript and to measure whether memory gets accessed, which means that we need a pretty good timer to be able to do this. Luckily for us, the browser standards committees have come up with an API to just do that. So 
you can take a timestamp, do an operation, and then take another timestamp, and then you get a very crisp time measurement. Until someone published a paper, which showed basically that you can do a last level cache attack on the CPU and discover some things. So the browser makers made the, time, the measurement much more granular. So every microsecond or so, you get a little bump. And then for one microsecond, nothing changes. But all is not lost for the attacker, because you can now turn the uh, coarse-grained timer into a fine-grained timer. What you can do, for example, is wait for this bump to happen, and then quickly do an operation, and then start a counter. And then the longer the operation takes, the smaller the, the count is when the jump happens. So in Chrome, they chose to vary the length of the time when, the, when this happens. But still, you can do multiple measurements, and then you take an average, and then you can still get a good measurement. However, we can do better. So the, the browser makers decided to make this a bit more difficult, but when the browser standards committee taketh, uh, they also giveth. So they decided to implement the, uh, an object called the shared array buffer, which allows multiple threads, which are called web workers in JavaScript, to work on a single piece of memory. And uh, they decided to enable this by default, which is actually after we published the attack. So they basically have given up on preventing uh, nanosecond scale time measurements in JavaScript. So the shared array buffer can be used for other things, but I'll not talk about it this, this today. So how can we measure time using shared memory? Well, it's quite simple. One thread is used for doing the timer measurement, and the other thread does the operation, and then so the timer thread waits until the thread, thread which does the operation is ready to do the operation. And then it sets a variable and does, uh, starts the operation. Meanwhile, the, the counter thread, the timer thread, uh, sees that, that the shared buffer has changed and will start counting. And then when the operation is done, the second thread changes the buffer again, and then the counter thread stops. So this gives a very crisp measurement. So now we have a nanosecond scale timer, and we can do side channel attacks from JavaScript. So we'll be doing a timer attack on the last level cache. And when the CPU accesses memory, everything is on the granularity of a cache line, which is 64 bytes. Uh, within for example, the level 3 cache, a certain physical address maps onto a certain cache set. And this cache set can, for example, uh, on a, on a four-core desktop Intel machine, contain 16 different cache lines. And I'll talk about a modern Intel machine, but the concept translates also to other microarchitectures. So per core, there are 2,048 cache sets, which are uh, called a slice. And yeah, so they're on a four-core machine, you have four slices. And these slices are shared among all the cores, but it's just the way Intel has organized their cache. So to get the cache set ID, so which cache site set within the slice is used, you take the physical address, and then you discard the six bits, which are basically telling you which byte within the cache line you use, and then take the 11 bits next, and that is the cache set. So it's basically a round robin mapping of the physical map memory. The cache slice is some complicated uh, hash function, and for this attack, we don't need it. So we're lucky. The important thing to remember is that if two cache sets, uh, cache lines in, in physical memory map to the same cache set, they have the same offset. Uh, yes, so th the same physical address if you only uh, only uh, regard the bits which are uh, yeah so, uh, so so they only regard the lowest bits so that every one they they have the same address modulo 128k kilobytes so 
from which follows that the, they also must have the same address modulo, modulo 4 kilobyte, and which happens to be the size of a memory page, which is the base unit of memory management on almost all architectures, I guess, in use. So now we know this, we can do cache side channel attack, and there are multiple attacks possible, and we'll probably use the, the most simple one called effect, effect and time. So the code to do the effect and time attack is also quite simple. You have an effect function which uses a buffer and just accesses cache lines which map into a certain cache set. And we can just do that by accessing the cache line which at a certain offset of a page which we just, we've just seen. And at this point, <coughs> all the cache lines should be filled with, with our data. So then we proceed to do an operation. We do take a timestamp, we do the, an operation, and we time how long this takes. If this operation needs to do something with a cache set which maps into this, uh, a cache line in physical memory which maps into this cache set, it will take longer because we'll have to do a memory access. And the memory accesses are really slow compared to the CPU or cache hits on mo modern computers. So <coughs> this way we, we can see if this operation depends on the physical memory location in which maps into this cache set. So how does this apply to the page table walk, which will attack? So page tables are a mechanism for processes to address a really large address space while only having a relatively small amount of physical memory. So it's basically a tree structure with tables at every level, which divide up the address space into equal parts. So the first level on Intel, so which is called the fourth level because there are four levels. Well, so it divides address space up in, into chunks of 512 gigabytes. The next level, which so there could be 512 entries, but they don't have there don't have to be. Uh, di divide the address space into one gigabyte chunks, then into two uh, megabyte chunks, and then lastly into four kilobyte chunks, which is the granularity of a page. So all, each entry in there points to a memory page, a physical memory page. So what the page table walk process does is it takes the address and will use a binary representation of this address because that's easier to show the process uh, where all uh, where the one bits are black and the white bits are zero. So say there's a TLB miss, so we'll have to do the page table walk. Now there's a special register in the CPU which points to the first page table. Then the hardware looks at the nine most significant bits in the address and then uses that as an index pointer into the table. Then it does the same with the next level, and with the next level, and with the next level, up until the level where we know the actual page, and then the 12 bits at the end will be used to point into this page. So this is a 4K page. So we can use this page to do a side channel attack. But the observation is that the page tables themselves are also pages. So yeah, each of, each of them are uh, pages. And so we can also do a side channel attack on these pages. So let's take a look of what we can discover this way. So we can find out that a certain page gets a hit. Now there are eight possible entries which would cause this hit. So we don't know that much, but if we look at these pages, we can see that six bits are the same. So we now know that there is a sequence of six bits in this address that has this value that we discovered by doing the cache timing side channel. Now there are four levels of pages and there is a final location into the page. So we get five cache colors. We assume we know the last location inside the page because that's in practice pretty easy to uh, reverse engineer 
And even if you can't, there are other side channels to find this out. In fact, we use this final location to do the side channel attack on all the other locations. So, or actually, we try to not get in the way. So, now we have found four cache lines, which may be used for the page table walk. So, we can see that there are four chunks of three bits that we know nothing about. And we, what we also don't know is which cache line is used for which level of page table. So that would give us about 16.6 .6 bits of entropy left. So that's not a lot that we have gained. We still need to find 16 bits. However, there is kind of a trick. So we have a technique called sliding, where we allocate a large enough buffer and then we just probe pages one after another time. So we just uh, yeah, try the next page, try the next page, try the next page. So it looks a bit like this. So for the last page table, we just try the next page, the next page, the next page. And then when it switches, we know, OK, this was a cache line boundary. So for the next page, we know that uh, <coughs> the lowest bits of this entry are all 0, because it just went over the boundary. This technique we can also do for the, the second level page tables. This time we add two megabytes, two megabytes, two megabytes, two megabytes. Still not that problematic to do from JavaScript. And then we get the whole second level page table entry. So how much entropy is left? So, well, we have got two chunks of three bits, and we don't know which cache line belongs to which page table level. So we are left with seven bits. And this is, so I think for this, there's not a lot to do ab about this if we want to have good timers in JavaScript. But we can actually do more because in practice stuff isn't optimal. So actually nowadays we s we're starting to be able to allocate one gigabyte allocations in JavaScript, which is probably because you want to run a real tournament in there or something. But then the, for the last level, it's, it's kind of too much, uh, 512 gigabytes allocations. And then you might be, uh, have to do that up to eight times. So maybe not. However, for example, for Firefox on Linux, if you allocate a certain type of object called an array buffer, Firefox doesn't initialize the memory. And it just asks the kernel for the memory and then just leaves it there. And what the Linux kernel does is it doesn't initialize it. And so it doesn't have to map in pages in the page table structure. And it doesn't use up any memory as long as you don't touch it. And we don't have to touch it. We just have to go over and touch one page or one page at the very end. So actually, on Linux, it turns out you can allocate huge chunks of virtual memory. And actually, within seconds, two minutes, you can basically do the sliding attack and flip the cache line on the highest level page table. Chrome does initialize memory, uh, which is a bit unfortunate for us. But uh, what it does is it divides memory up into heaps. And when the heap is full, or it decides, OK, I'll maybe for security reasons, I'll need to create a new one. To increase uh, ASLR, actually, it tries to leave a huge gap between the previous heap and the new heap, which means we can <coughs> move forward quickly in the address space. So using this method of creating new heaps, or we can recover the third level address bits, which would leave us with three bits of entropy left. But doing the attack on the fourth level would take a lot of time, and maybe because uh, Chrome needs to initialize and free lots of memory, and it just takes time, and your laptop gets hot, so maybe the user will click away and no uh, recovery for you. So this attack was implemented on a Skylake machine, but has been verified that it works on uh, 22 machines by testing the side channel with the native C program. So yeah. <laughs> so time uh, for a demo video. So. Oh. 
So here we have obviously the browser. So these bits are the raw measurements, and what you see here are signals detected by an, uh, a solver, which tries to find the most likely values uh, for the attack. So. Looks really pretty, matrix style. So. And then, yeah, the solvers try to get confidence on what they're me measuring up to a certain point, and then they decide, okay, it's clear. And then, uh, attack, uh, attaching GDB to verify the address, we can see that. The address <coughs> is a location of memory that we know. And because of that, we left a marker there. So that's. Uh, So, in conclusion, it's uh, possible to recover quite a lot of address information from JavaScript using a hardware side channel alone on the memory management unit. And uh, apparently, browser vendors have given up on this or any other side channel attacks because you can't have multi processing with shared memory without this. And apparently, that's the direction we're going. So, yeah. Any questions? As always, please line up at the microphones. Uh, we'll start with number one, please. Yes, uh, have you looked at actual browser bugs and uh, looked at how many are exploitable with just a single leaked pointer? I mean, usually you need at least two. You need a code pointer and some, somewhere to, to write to actually gain a control over the execution flow. So in, in our attack, uh, we also have a, a way to leak a code pointer. So. We first leak a data pointer, and then we create lots of JavaScript pages, jitted JavaScript code. And then, so leaking these most significant pages is really hard to do for code, but the page tables, which point to the actual pages, and uh, I think also one level above, is actually pretty easy to, well, easy. It's doable to, to leak using this technique. Could we get mic number four, please? Uh, so you just criticized the uh, browser uh, creators for the, um, well, not trying to mitigate all these security issues. What would you, as an uh, ASLR hacker, recommend the browsers to do? What are the measures they could take that they have not yet taken? So one of the things that make this attack quite easy is that browser makers have, have tried to prevent against another problem called uh, use after free vulnerabilities by allocating more memory every t in a different region every time because if you can free memory and then allocate something else and then the a bug in the browser will use it as if it were the old object for example then you can do usually quite bad stuff so you can think of mitigations against this technique, but they might work against the mitigations against use after free. So the question also becomes, is it still worth it? So yeah. Uh, also because there are only seven bits that are not inherent to the architecture. So yeah, the question is, in a, an environment where you can run JavaScript, is, it, is ASLR, uh, yeah, it might help a bit and sure, Ben and Kave spent lots of hours on implementing this, so an exploit writer might, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it will still be extra effort if there's no easier way. But yeah, I'm not sure. Though. <laughs> Could we get a question from the internet, please? Given that ASLR is only meant to help protect against remote attacks, uh, how useful is your approach when an attacker cannot exercise the MMU? 
So the attacker would always exercise the MMU, but I guess choosing the location is harder and the timing is, of course, over the network way more difficult. So I don't really, yeah. So, but the thing is that ASLR is used against local attackers and this shows that, that there are inherently inside the architecture problems with this and that it's not that useful, apparently. Can we get mic number one, please? So, um, recently I saw a vulnerability about a um, security research on Loki Hard, which was for iOS. And in your presentation, I saw, of course, the Samsung Cortex A7, which is the iPhone 5's processor. Um, what I'm wondering is if I create an array in JavaScript containing my shell code, um, am I able to, with this attack, to get the address of that specific array, or is that impossible? So, <clears throat> so you sh I guess shellcode itself won't be executable in an array, but so, so you will get location of memory that you control completely, if that's what you... Uh... Okay, that, that's actually what I meant. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, is there a PUC available, or uh, is this kept closed source? And I th don't think we usually don't release the attack code. We do describe it in the paper, so it should be reproducible using the paper. Right. Thank you. Okay. And we'll just stay at mic one. I didn't get uh, the graphic you showed us uh, in JavaScript. What were the colors, and what were you trying to say there in the y and x axis? Uh, that's. Can you say stop or? <laughs> in your video, for example, or? Oh, oh yeah, so. <clears throat> so I, I'm not completely sure about the first one. Might be raw measurements. The, the second one, well, are, are the, the page tables that we try to, the lookups that we try to find. Yeah. So you, yeah. Okay. And more from mic, mic one, please. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you guys actually uh, tested this technique on uh, public clouds or any any multi-tenant uh, architecture. Uh, so this attack is within the browser. So yeah, we we tested it as if it were a client, a browser client. I mean, uh, like, I, I would like to continue, actually, if, if, the, if it's okay. We have a lot of time. Ah, all right. So, uh, I was, uh, actually, I read a couple of things about this. Uh, my question was not really specifically about the ASLR, but more like how it could be, like, the mitigation techniques for, uh, like, public cloud where each tenant has the right access to the cache line and how uh, is that, do you think, possible to do, to disclose the, the cache line? So, yeah, the, there, there have been quite a few attacks using this technique also just natively like you would do in a VPN environment, for example. Uh, is the guy... VPS environment. Oh, sorry. You're on. So there is a browser plugin from some uh, researchers at TU Graz uh, called JavaScript Zero, which aims to provide mitigation against uh, sidechain attacks from JavaScript. Have you heard of it? And if so, have you tried if it provides protection against the attacks you showed? So I think, so I haven't tried it, but uh, what I described, I would say it would uh, provide protection because it, uh, it, it allows you to disable stuff you don't want, among which, which the shared array buffer. So in principle, the shared array buffer wasn't here before this year anyhow. And I doubt lots of public code makes use of it. So I think it's easy to disable stuff you don't want. There's JavaScript, they're basically adding stuff all the time to make it suitable for, for gaming and all kinds of sensors that you want. And, so, and most code doesn't make use of it. For example, I only use JavaScript on my, in my browser when the page doesn't load without. I'm all for disabling lots of stuff that we don't need, but uh, 
the, the direction of the browser seems to go the other direction. So uh, I guess we'll see uh, how it will turn out in the end. So. Do we have any more questions? No? Then please thank our speaker again.